it's late. Sorry for that. Uh, before I start our lecture for today, I want to clarify or set things a bit um, straight with us here. We are all matured adults, right? We are all matured and just want something to add on to whatever we have to get us to a certain level. Let us try our best to mat act maturity, right? Some of us have already had BSc uh, or uh, degree, maybe not BSc in nursing, and so you want to add on BSc in nursing. I'm sure some of us even have masters in a different discipline, but they want one in nursing, and so they want to do the nursing aspect in degree, and then go to the um, other academic ladder up high. So most of us here are matured. Of course, some are also diploma um graduates where we want to add on so we can get to a certain level we are not like our regular students where we just completed senior high and then just came in so if there are any issues any issues at all i have been so open enough that anyone who has any issues would want to come closer in terms of let's say messaging or whatever of course there are sometimes some of us wouldn't um get that much opportunity because we have a lot of things doing and so when you send messages it's difficult for us to reply but i know i take my time out of my busy whatever and then sometimes try to respond to whoever contacts me in relation to our course last semester we talked about or we discussed or we had whatever nursing practice right and then it was like and um, we had a practical exams. With the practical exams, we had some stipulated dates or days for the practical exams. Some of you couldn't even make it, especially those in the commercial center. And so there were some days that they came in on campus if I was there. Even if I wasn't there, I just call one of my colleagues for them to examine them. Others who were privileged enough for me to get to um, other centers where I went for invigilation, and then they had one or two ways to um, get a bit of scores. So if there were anything in relation to that, the best thing I thought you could do as adults was to come closer to me in terms of messaging or calls. I have few of you here who are in, in quotes, my friends, where I have met and then we've chit chat. I'm not the person who is so difficult to approach. And so when you meet me, one or the other, you can just give me a smile and I'll smile back and then we talk. Yet there were issues that you had in relation to nursing practice. No one contacted me and it's out there in school. And that is very, very bad of us. If we are saying we are matured students where a lecturer has given you that opportunity to get in a way, be able to just contact her and then if there's any issue, you went out there just ranting. I don't know. I Now the maturity I had in you is all gone. It's all gone. The fact is a fact. No matter how much you are old, a lecturer is a lecturer. That is one thing I always want to tell you. And I understand why some lecturers also just behave the way they behave with students. But for me, I feel that you are adults. The way I behave with regular students, I can't behave that way with you. You know one thing, you will see that the person will behave in this way, they will, they will see that the lecturer will be like, hey, it's not on way any. Hey, this one, and then we are afraid of, she's the person, this is the lecturer who was taking this, and then we are afraid so much about or, or fair or whatever, getting closer to it. It doesn't worth it. So please, if now we are about finishing our course or our, yes, our program, Maybe you go out somewhere. Definitely you'll be a student again. Know how to behave towards each individual you meet. I'm sure you are learning all these things. You start from 300, even though you've learned some of them in the diploma level and other courses that you have encountered. Yet still, you have learned something about communication, how to approach somebody, even as nurses, 
how to give a therapeutic communication, therapeutic touch to your patient. So why are we not giving this kind of therapeutic touch to ourselves? Honestly, I'm disappointed in you. I know whoever, maybe some of the reps are not aware of whatever, but there is something some of you are ranting out there in school. You have to be careful. Anyway, that's just theories of aging in gerontology. Theories of aging. And um, for today's topic, it will more or less be a lecture. There will be a bit of discussion, but it wouldn't be so much. I would have to, you, you just imagine the topic. It wouldn't be something that we will all share a lot of ideas, but I think at the latter part, there'll be a lot of ideas to be shared. So it will basically be lecture and a bit of discussion. Well, as usual, I'll give you something to begin the course or the, the topic with. So somebody wrote it out there that I had to wait 110 years. I wanted to enjoy it as long as possible. Just to mean that in a way, right from the first year to 110, and so he didn't want to die. He or she, I don't know, Jean is a she or he, he wants to die and still wanted to enjoy more. That will introduce us to the topic for the day series of aging. And so when you have more and you think that at this my level, at this age, there would be that kind of death waiting for me. Who is going to enjoy my money? Who is going to enjoy my um, buildings, my assets, all those things? So they would want to find out ways where they can live longer ways where they can live longer. And so I channeled upon one name, Ponce de Leon, a France or a French person who said that um he was he sought in ways to get younger or ways where he can live longer. So he seek a fountain of youth. So fountain of youth seeking was it medication that he took? Was it exercise that he was doing? Was it something else embedded in the rivers, in the valleys, in the forest that he went out to get, so that he will still get that youthful um, exuberance and then that youthful life where he can still enjoy whatever. Why do we really age? So there's no single universally accepted definition of age. I think we discussed that last week. It is best looked at as we know that definitely there'll be changes loss of function, and then even ultimately death. Definitely like all living organisms, we, they, we birth them and then they die. And they affect us as humans as well. We discussed life expectancy last week as well. And so there should be that kind of age when you reach, you have this kind of fear that definitely you are going to go. So what do you do? You have a lot of things there waiting for you to enjoy. You have suffered. Some of us wouldn't even enjoy life. We suffer and suffer and suffer at the time that we want to enjoy all what we have suffered to get. That is where we start getting problems with our physique, with our bones, with our skins and all those things. Problems with aging. Why do we age at all? Why do we age at all? So why different people live lives of different lengths? Some will go as far as 70, 80, 100, 110, 120. Why? You have been saying life expectancy up to 120, but some will go as far as 120, um, one, is it 110 or 115, 125, 130. We hear that a lot, even though they are just rare, but they still happen. Some will get to about 18, they still look so young. Why all these things? Why those differences in, in that? And so, we are saying that there'll be biologic processes. There are some biologic factors that causes all these changes in, in the way people live. Of course, there'll be sociological as well as the psychosocial aspect as well. 
So there's no definite um, evidence indicating exactly why we age. In the book, that's what they are saying. They said they are all theories. And theories are such that it is an individual or sometimes two or more who develop that kind of theory. Mostly, um, even in an academic level, when you get to the doctoral level, before you complete a doctorate or a doctoral program, you should be able to develop something new. So you can develop a theory, you can develop a model, and then it, it goes on. You can develop frameworks, guidelines to, to help in the field that you are in. And so with the theories we are talking about, definitely means that in that field of gerontology, somebody has, or two or more, have developed a theory that is backing whatever evidence they have. Of course, you should get evidence to back that theory. And so their own theory doesn't necessarily mean that they are factual. They are saying that is happening. They are just there. And of course, they have evidence to back them, right? And so somebody can take one theory and debunk it and critique it. So after critiquing, you can also come out with your own theory. So these are what theories are all about. Theories of aging, they've been con considered uh, throughout humanity, throughout history. It has been there. So the things that the theories have brought out, what is it for us? So we as nurses also, we are supposed to know all these things, the physical, psychosocial, the cultural aspects, to help in promoting health for these older adults and also for successful aging. We say life expectancy is rising at rates which call for proper preparation for us as nurses to take good care of these older adults. And I think we discussed that a bit in um, last week's lecture.
All right, thank you. So um we're talking about the we're talking about the biological theories where we said that um we have different kinds of species and then we all suffer gradual progressive loss of function over time because of our biological biological structures, right? And so each theory attempts to describe the processes of aging by exhibiting various changes in cell structure or function. So biologic theories of aging attempt to, it just explains the physical changes of aging, the physical changes that occurs during aging. So we try to, in some sense, right? So the genes are involved in these kinds of regulation, the growth, development, you age, you grow up, these developmental stages. And then the last bit are senescence, right? And so whenever this time, this thing happens, there's a lifespan. So the program theory is such that aging is not solely a result of um, external factors. I seen, uh, oh, this you had a car crash or a road traffic accident and died or whatever, whatever. But always it's about the intrinsic factors, the, the one which is genetic, the genetic factors. So age and death are natural and necessary parts of genetics. That is what the program theory is telling us today, right? And so they are saying that aging has a biological timetable or internal biological clock. Then run out of program theory. Now we have run out of our cell divisions. So what, what else? If there is no cell division, then there is death. There is cellular death of case. So every person has a limited amount of genetic material that will run out over time. So after maturation, genes have been activated. There are no more programs. There are none to be done. Then it means that there's time for us to live. Rate of living theory. This proposes that individuals have a finite number of breaths or heartbeats, which are used over time. You know, the biological theory is such that they are saying that always organisms have metabolic rates and lifespan in, 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 in their lifespan, right? So this theory suggests that the higher your metabolic rates, then it means that the shorter your lifespan. That's the rate of living theory. Whilst those who have the lower metabolic rates have a, 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 a longer lifespan. So this idea, they are saying that uh, the organism's metabolism, the more quickly its cells are divided and tissues wear out, it leads to uh, a prolonged, uh, no, sorry, accelerated um, aging and then a shorter lifespan. But if your metabolic is rather lower, that leads to a prolonged uh, lifespan. And that is the rate of living um, theory we have here. Now we have gene theory, gene theory. And then the gene theory proposes the existence of one or more harmful genes that activate over time, resulting in the typical changes seen with aging and limiting the lifespan of the individual. So there's variations in genes and they can impact cell functions. And that leads to either accelerated growth or slower growth. So this is talking purposely about our genes. Gene theory also can influence the rate at which uh, individual ages. So certain genes may predispose somebody or an individual to a, an age-related disease, or even contribute to the overall uh, cellular function. So that's it about our gene theory. So one will support the growth and vigor, and then the other supports senescence and then deterioration. That's always please, madam. Yes. Uh, please excuse me. Like about the rate theory, you were talking okay. of uh, uh, like about uh, about uh, living organisms. Those having the larger, like those who are large, they live longer than. Uh -huh. The example that you give, this was uh, postulated mm -hmm. with the observation that larger animals. Postulated with so, the observation we... that larger animals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, can we, can we use same right. to human, human beings? Can we use same to human beings? So what would that be the example you cite in relation to humans? 
like if can we also say that those large, larger human beings or fat or big uh, human beings have lower metabolism or can can live longer than slim well in terms of the theory well thank you who would answer that for us please who answered that for us if you really understood the example in the points in terms of the bullets the point two the second and the last bullet he's saying that okay if you are saying animal uh, elephants they are large and so uh, they have lower uh, slower metabolism and live longer as compared to the small ones in terms of humans what happens In terms of humans, no. Okay, so the other around with humans. Because mm -hmm. human beings, they, uh, like those who are fat, they have high metabolism rate. So okay. as a result, it's the opposite way. Okay. Okay. So you know when I was explaining, I didn't even mention the example. I said something about uh, the suggesting that. Any organism having higher metabolic acid as did tend to have shorter lifespan. It tends to have shorter life. If you have higher metabolic rate, you have shorter lifespan. Whilst those with lower metabolic rate. So let's rather use that 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 statement I have given. Both with the lower metabolic rate live longer. And so if you compare the obese with the uh, I say the normal weight. If you compare that, which one would have a higher metabolic rate? Madam, please, obese people have lower metabolic rates. That's why they are not able to use up whatever is consumed. You get it. Well, Oh, oh. Obese, obese people have high metabolic rate okay. or metabolic rate. Those who have higher metabolic rate, they live shorter lifespan. They live shorter lifespan. And then those with lower metabolic rate rather live longer in terms of the rate of living theory. So now let me let me just try to chip in this so that. You don't get confused. You know, as a theory, and before I started with this theory, say, I said that I said that whoever Wendy, theory Wendy. Is such that, yeah. Hello? I am not the host of the program, and I haven't been also the co-host of the program. I can't mute all of us. So if now I have seen that we are all not matured, yes. So if out of our immaturity, we'll still go ahead and do this, fine. That's up to us, right? Okay. So I have said that in terms of theory, now you have had a critique in this. If you think that you can really want to critique this, then you can take this out, go search more about it, read more about it, and see if you can come out with a new theory that is debunking this theory, right? It is said that those who have a higher metabolic rate, let's say, um, say obese and then a normal weight, which ones have lower metabolic rate and which one would have higher metabolic rate? Which one? Obese and low, normal weight. The obese no, people have high metabolic rate. In humans, they have high metabolic rate. So in humans, is the obese that have higher metabolic rate, right? Yes, okay. please. Because okay. the, the body tends okay. to break down a lot of fat. Mm -hmm. Madam, is the other way around? And then, obese who is speaking? Abigail, please, 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 if you want to speak, yes, please. even though I can't now, just raise your hand so I see and then pour you out. So Abigail, what's okay. yours? What's your take? Madam, please, I think it's around because obese people are not able to use 
um, whatever is consumed. And so we tend to store it in our fats. That is why we have excess fats. However, them um, normal weight people use whatever they consume. And so they don't store fats. All right. Okay. Thank you. So let me cite this example. You see, we exercise a lot. So let's take a typical example, somebody who would exercise. That person will use a lot, will, will have a higher metabolic rate because most of the things are used. Most are used. But somebody who is just sedentary, metabolism will be low, right? In that way, it means that yes. obese will have a lower metabolic rate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Please. And with our example, so we are saying that with the theory, with this rate of living theory, the um which was the elephants, right? The larger animals have a a lower metabolic rate and so is the obese but in humans it's rather the obese that you are saying that they wouldn't have a, this higher lifespan right it is rather the in, in terms of the animals the mice will have a higher lifespan we are saying that in humans the normal way to rather have a higher lifespan so you can debunk this theory mm -hmm. if you want to you can debunk this theory but it's a theory that has been proposed that has been there in terms of age, right? So if you have anything, we can just go on. Let's take the specialty gerontology as a part of us and then use it so we can see if we can take this on and then critique it. It's an interesting uh, special. Yes. Please, my Ah, uh, Okay. Yes. Idrisu, symbol. Yes, madam. Because, symbol. like, yes, madam. Uh -huh. uh, we intend to say that the obese or overweight, if you don't do exercise, you might get this uh, uh, coronary artery diseases and you might die early, you might die, and your yeah. time might, might not be due. So yes. that is why I, I intend asking this question because mm -hmm. in the theory they said if you if you have lower metabolism and then those people live longer than those having uh, faster metabolism. Uh -huh. But now that we've, we've come to realize that the the obese people have lower metabolism, meaning they will live longer if they if, if they don't do any exercise to burn down any fat or to increase the the metabolism rate meaning they would rather live longer than we do who have been doing exercise all the time. Okay. So if I get yeah. you right, I cited the example here with uh, animals or, or organisms. Oh, we are all living organisms, but with animals, right? So it's, mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, in terms of reciting our examples, of course, we are going to tend that to take, take of our patients. So in terms of that, we are... Um, Focusing that on us, we the individuals, the humans, our patients. Okay. But we have come to realize that it is rather the obese who would have a lower metabolic rate. Yes. So it means that in a way, this rate of living theory um wouldn't be so much accepted by us. Yes. Okay. Are you getting it? Yes. Yes. A theory we just have to know that this is what has been stated in geriatrics right okay you would by the time we are end with this lecture we are ending we by the time we end with this lecture you realize that there are some theories that somebody some some has even debunked and has been added to it maybe especially with the psychosocial theories mostly some of them have come out current ones have come out debunking an old one which was like maybe 1950-something, 1960-something, and has come to the banquet. Are you getting it? But maybe with this, there hasn't been any critique. And maybe if there has been critiques, um, I have been limited to that kind of critique. And maybe it hasn't okay. been really accepted. Are you getting it? To be yes. part of the theories. And so if it's not accepted, um, out of my reading, I, would, I can't really necessarily add it onto our lectures.
Are you okay. getting it? So take it on and read more about it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you too. Um, is there any messages in the chat? Okay. And then. I think we were done with gene theory and then we have the molecular theories. Molecular theories. They focus on understanding the aging process. Madam, I, I rose my hand. You didn't go. Please, please talk. What do you have for us? For me, please. Nashiru Dean, what do you have for us? All right. Now, children, your hands are still up. Do you have anything for us? All right. So the molecular theory is proposing that aging is controlled by a genetic material that is encoded to predetermine growth and decline. It is saying that aging is focused on understanding the aging process at the cellular and the molecular level. So if you really understand our cells, and then the molecules also that react the elements, we would try to understand also what the molecular theories is talking about. Of course, the molecular theories are a lot. And with um what you are supposed to know for the day, I can't add on so much of the molecular theory. I think I have just one after this slide. So you can, if you want, go and then read more about the molecular theory. They are saying that it explores how changes in the cellular and then the molecular components affect aging. The DNA, the proteins, we know they are all uh, molecules, right? And so how they also affect the aging, uh, aging process. So we have several of them, several of the molecular theories. One is the somatic mutation theory. Somatic mutation theory, where it proposes that aging results from damage to the DNA caused by exposure to chemicals or radiation. So this, this thing changes our genes, it changes our cells, it changes the molecules. This damage causes chromosomal abnormalities that lead to disease or loss of function. Of course, if your DNA is, is, is damaged or defected, you can realize whatever that can happen to you. Exposure to X-ray radiation and or chemicals induces chromosomal abnormalities. So there's always an imbalance between the DNA's ability to repair itself and then the accumulating damage. Of course, you know our body is such that whatever, whenever there's any defect, it tries to repair it, but the, the damage is getting, it will be on and on and on. We we'll talk about something we call free radicals. There is a way you talk about, we see that some of the molecules just detach and then come yeah. in their genes. And so when it happens that way, the ability for the DNA to repair itself is difficult. And so it causes any um, diseases or any uh, malfunction in the yeah, system. Madam, please, I have, have a question. Yes, yes. Madam, please, uh, from our previous or whatever that we've discussed now, I learned we have the biological theories, we have the somatic, the cellular, and others. Mm -hmm. So please, I want to know, for the programmed theory or the biological clock theory, yes. as well as the living theory and the gen, uh, gene theory, please, what, gene where theory. do they fall under? They are all under biological theories. Bio so let's take it biology. They are all under biology. We haven't gotten to the second and the third theories. Are you getting Madam, that? So please, does biology. it mean that? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that uh, the program and the uh gen they are all in addition to the those biological that we've listed here? Yes, please. Okay, I want you. to, you know, you know, theories are such that I, that's why initially I just explained a bit about theory. It is such that, let's say, let me just come down to our level, let's say, um, 
let's say we are checking a patient's uh, vital signs. And with this, our vital signs, you have realized that always the routine thing we do in our wards are the 6, 10, uh, 2, 6, that routine thing. Of course, you know, even at that, that one, it is somebody, an author who predisposed this, who just found out that, okay, let me do it this way and then get a routine for us all. And then we all followed. So it is something that somebody has just sat down, read through the literature, had a bit of evidence, and then brought it out as a theory. And so it would be that somebody will bring a theory about, oh, 6, 10, 2, 10, or whatever vital signs we check, the routine one. You as well would think that, okay, on the walls, is it necessarily about 6, 10, or whatever? Let's say, can we do it every two hours, not necessarily four hourly? Then you also come out and then write two hourly, whatever, whatever, and then add on a bit of evidence with literature. This is more or less about research, with literature. Then you bring it out. So if you have your evidence backing it with literature, then that's it. It will be graphs and then as put as part of our the, the theory list in terms of that discipline. And so in terms of the gerontological discipline, they have outlined the biological theories, developmental theories, and psychosocial theories. And out of that biological theory, somebody is talking about 2 p.m. or 4 hourly vital signs. Somebody is also talking about, let's say, 2 hourly vital signs. Somebody can as well talk about 1 hourly uh, uh, heart rate. These are all under vital signs. Somebody can as well talk about, let's say, 2 hour, uh, or 30 minutes or hourly RBS check. It can also be a part of vital science check. Are you getting it? So don't necessarily think that if we say biological theory, it should be focused on just the cells and then the genes and then the molecules. Even when you talk about molecules, then we are talking about even a bit of chemistry, right? So it is in general about the biological factors of an individual, of the human system. So from the program theory, when we come to the cellular, you, you, you think that or you see that there's a bit of changes. This is about the cells. So we all understand because we are nurses and we know that cells are in relation to biology. What about just saying that, oh, we ran out of a program and then you can just, when you are best and the time you die, within that time is a biological clock. That is also somebody's biological theory that he or she brought out. Are you getting the point, please? Yes, please, madam. Thank you. Thank you too. So we come to the cellular theories where we say that they propose the aging as a process that occurs because of cell damage. So when enough cells are damaged, of course, overall functioning, that one, of course, I'm sure would really understand that because we know how cells lead to the system. So cellular theories of aging, they focus on the changes of cellular levels of any organism. So of course, with aging of an individual as well. That explains how the alteration in cells contributes the, to senescence. Then we have the free radical theory. Free radical theory. Cells provides one explanation for cell damage. The free radicals are unstable molecules produced by the body during the normal processes of respiration. So it's also a part of cellular theory. The free radicals is a part of cellular theory. It's in terms of the cells. So, and in a way, it can be a part of molecular theories. It's like a molecule or an atom um, detaching itself from the normal molecules or the normal range of atoms that shape up to form the cells. So the atom or the molecules are detached from the paired or the, the grouped uh, electrons or molecules that forms uh, these cells, making it uh, uh, sort of a disadvantage to the rest. And so when it detaches itself to other DNA, it means that this is not where it's supposed to be. It has detached from another part to another part, and then that place, it causes harm. So it, it interacts with our DNAs, our proteins, our lipids, the fats, all those things, and then cause 
disease or a malfunction in that organ. So that is for the free radical theory. It damages the DNA, it damages the immune system in general. So an excessive accumulation of free radical in the body is purported to contribute to the physiological changes of aging and a variety of diseases. We have the arthritis, we have the cardiovascular disease, we have the diabetes. Of course, and these are all theories. Well, they say there is one free radical called the lipofusin that has been identified to cause the buildup of fatty pigment granules, which causes age spots in older adults. But they are saying that when you consume vitamins, A, C, E, zinc, selenium, and this phytochemical, the beta carotene and others, also the vitamin B6 and 12, you can as well protect yourself from these ones. The beta carotenes, we can find some in these our um, green leafy vegetables. These are our grapes, the, those expensive vegetables. Mostly these ones, the carrots, well, carrots are not expensive. Well, we have our consumers are expensive, but most of the ones also, the grapes, the apricot, the strawberries, they are also expensive. And you see a lot of these ones also find in there. But vitamin B6 and 12 also, you know, A, vitamins A and C, the E is also, even the zinc, you can also find them in our normal uh, uh, fruits and then the vegetables as well. So let's see if we can encourage our older adults as well as ourselves to consume this one. Of course, if you take them as supplements, sometimes it is not so healthy, but if you take them as in its raw state, as we all know, it helps in terms of our diet, right? So we have the cross-link theory, as well as it's also known as the connective tissue theory. We also call it the collagen theory. It said that it's proposed that cell molecules from DNA and connective tissues interact with free radicals to cause the bonds, and that's the cross links. So it means that the free radical joining itself to another DNA, another protein, another lipid, and that is causing that cell damage. So in a way, it is influenced by a gradual uh, a sort of accumulation of this cross link uh, between a protein and then collagen, these DNA tissues, and they cause this uh, uh, extracellular uh, matrix. They cause this link. They cause the link, and then in our tissues, it causes more formation. It also causes even stiffening and then reduced elasticity in the skin. And then that leads to this aging uh, changes, this, uh, the dryness, the, the wrinkles, and then, uh, yes, lots of elasticity, last, I think I have, I have said it. Also, fibrous tendons, loosening of the teeth, the managing elasticity of arterial walls, and these are the reasons that causes this coronary uh, artery disease and the uh, peripheral artery disease as well. Decreased efficiency of the lungs and then the GI tract. So all these things, out of the, the the free radicals forms the cross link theory or the cross linkage that is that is the uh, extra cellular matrix of the connective tissues and it leads to these skin changes the GIT changes the arterial changes and then the dental changes as well so now cataract and then the appearance of tough leathery yellow skin we should know that this cross link theory or this connective tissue theory, it leads to the stiffening and reduced elasticity of tissues. If you have stiffening of the tissue, then you should know whatever will happen in whatever system you want to focus on. All right. Then we have the clinker theory. The clinker theory where we say that um, it's a combination of the uh, somatic mutation, free radicals, and then the cross link theory. The clinker is a combination of these. It means that the molecular theory and then the cross link theory. 
and suggests that chemicals produced by metabolism accumulate in normal cells and cause damage to body organs such as the muscle, the heart, nerves, and brains. A lot of people, a lot of students are leaving and joining, but this is also a, a lecture that we all should enjoy. All right. Then we have the we have the wear and tear theory. So wear and tear is wear and tear. Whenever you have, I'm sure most of us have vehicles where, uh, if not vehicle, we have any something that's always when you are using it, you always will always want to maintain it, have or have to service it. Even with our normal, but even if you are not aging, our normal youth. You you realize that you you work and at a point you feel very weak. You have to just sleep. After sleeping, you feel good, right? The body is similar to these machines, which loses function when its parts wear out. So as people age, their cells, tissues, and organs are damaged by internal or external stresses. A lot of stresses. If you want to talk about them, there are a lot, right? So when enough damage of the body parts has occurred. Its overall function decreases, of course. So this wear and tear is as a result of aging. And also, good health maintenance practices will reduce the rate of wear and tear, resulting in longer and better body function. This is also a theory. But you realize that some of the theories are, in a way, fitting into our society, and some also, in a way, are not. Then the last bit of the biological theories is the immunologic theory. Immunologic theory, we know that as we age, our immune, is, immune system uh, decreases. It, it, it's more function in a way, the generation of cells occurs. And so uh, they are saying that an important defense mechanism is the immune system, where it weakens over time, making an aging person more susceptible to diseases. Now we are moving on to the psychosocial theories. Any questions here? Any questions with biological theories? All right, let's move on. Psychosocial theories, they explain why older adults have different responses to the aging process. It doesn't explain, you know, the biological theory, when I said, I said that it explains the physical changes of aging, right? But psychosocial theories, doesn't, it does not explain the physical. Rather, it attempts to explain why older adults have different responses to aging. Or to the aging process. A different. This one is this is an innate thing, or in terms of our cells, in terms of our organ, our system. That's the biology aspect, and then the psychosocial. Why this? Why that? Why the response to aging? So it explains the behavior, personality changes, roles and relationships of these older adults. Even societal changes, even cultural changes, cultural roles, the interaction that we have between one another, and so all these things contribute to a uh, successful adjustment to aging. And so we have the disengagement theory, we have the activity theory, the continuity theory, and then the subculture theory. Disengagement theory that's proposed or that has been um, authored by Carmen and Henry in 1961. And it is very controversial. And so I think in, in, in my readings, I realized that it is a disengagement theory that people have really critiqued. So in, in all the books, they've said this is a highly controversial uh, theory, disengagement theory, and it's saying that older people are systematically separated 
or excluded or disengaged from society because they are not perceived to be of benefit to society. I'm sure if I ask you a question uh, to open, if I, I open the floor right now, a lot of people will disagree with this. Systematically separated. So are you saying that they are just shut away from the society? And that is what Carmen and Harry are saying. They propose that older adults want to withdraw from society as they age. Is that so? Or it was so in the 1960s and now there's a change? Disengagement is mutually beneficial. So they are also saying that as much as the older adults want to leave the society, society wants to also separate from them. So they explain why aging persons separate from the mainstream of society. They are simply withdrawing. So critiques also believe that it attempts to justify ageism, right? It justifies the aging process. It also sort of oversimplifies the psychosocial adjustment. You are just saying that, oh, okay, we, we are withdrawing away from them or separating away, separating from them, and they are also separating from us. Just that. It's just oversimplified. And so we would know that there has been critique in relation to that. Right. Continuity theory. And that is also from, is it then, however you mentioned the name you see on your screen here, 1964. It states that, of course, I will mention it's Newgarten. It states that Newgarten is saying that the personality remains the same and behavior becomes more predictable as people age. So uh, continuity theory is telling us that there, hasn't, there wouldn't be any uh, much difference, any much changes. But as you age, that is where we really, really see your true personality. Personality and behavior patterns develop during a lifetime determine the degree of engagement and activity in older adults. So gradually with time, you wouldn't see so much difference, but that is where you realize that this person, this is how she was or he was, but maybe it was because he wasn't having enough money. He wasn't having whatever, whatever. That is why he or she was coiled up. But now that's the true character, the true personality of this individual. And that is what continuity theory is telling us. Personality is a critical factor in determining the relationship between role activity and life satisfaction. So I have reached my point or a point where I have enough. Let me be my true self. I don't care about anyone. That is how continuity theory is telling us. And I think in a way, um, we, we cannot attest or we can no, not attest, but agree to that in a way. Because we see um, older adults who want to go on vacations. You, they get to a point where now they, they see they are self-actualized. And so... Why should I be at I home? Let me just go out on my on my uh hey, but I I my vacation, my, my leave or my retirement. Know. Even when they retire, they want to just go and explore. When they have any leave, for instance, they will just have to go on vacation, go out. They want to be seen in the limelight. You have this uh one is this our uh, uh festive festive occasions when these uh, the musicians are coming around to host a program. You see these older adults in there dancing, happily enjoying themselves. They want to be found, they want to be known. But maybe some years back, you weren't seeing them, we weren't seeing them. They weren't so much in the limelight. And so they are saying that there's no so there's not so much difference between that personality and then aging, right? And then subculture theory. Subculture theory that's developed by Rose in 1965. Rose is saying that older adults from a unique subculture within society, older adults from a unique subculture within society to defend against society's negative attitude towards aging and the accompanying loss of status. 
Okay, so just just to tell you that in subculture theory, um, older adults in a way form the, a group or association, sort of uh, forming groups to protect uh, against societal or loss of societal status. They want to protect themselves. And so this is where they form their socialization stuff identity formation where you see some groups where uh, they are all let's say women for instance mostly you have women where they have above the age of 60s forming a group you see them going somewhere all dressed up in a big uh, t-shirt in trousers in foot upon probing you realize that they are all either widows or is it widow yes widows or maybe they're even divorced or they have a specific line that they all too. You see the men also, they have some clubs where they go and join golf club and whatever, tennis club and whatever, what have you. You find out that those there also have a, a unique um, um, character that they also share or a unique trait that they also share. And so they form those things where they can protect themselves. So let's say a group of uh, retired individuals for instance pensioners forming a club or an organization where they can engage in activities playing cards playing tennis organizing outings so in saturdays they meet they take their whatever if it's club if it's their guinness mostly the adult that's what you see there if it's coke they, they have these things and then most of the times also there are people where they have a bit of money with them some also with the low class also you see them also at a bar where they have their palm wine in, in, in the middle, where they'll be pouring bits of it and then talking. They start with playing dummies and other things. So that is, in a way, uh, talking about racist theory, subculture theory, where they form that kind of socialization. So older adults are a subculture with their own norms and beliefs. So they protect themselves. They have that organized. Within that, they have their own status. The subculture occurs as a response to loss of status. In the subculture, individual status is based on health and mobility instead of education, occupation, and economic achievement. That's not where they are going to talk about, I have this, I have... Of course, sometimes it happens. That's why, as I said, it depends on your status as well in life. Because if you don't have anything, you can also join a certain group. Yours is also for another group. And they always find themselves in some groups. They find themselves in groups. And then we have activity theory. So this also debunked the uh, disengagement theory. It proposes that activity is necessary for successful aging. Active participation in physical and mental activities helps maintain function well into old age so these were two authors and i'm sure a lot of uh, theories will come up in some years to come debunking a lot of theories that we have discussed today research reviews aging people withdraw from traditional roles and involve in more meditative self-focused activity the continuation of activities proposed during middle age is necessary for successful aging. So it's not necessarily you just withdrawing and staying back. Or you separating yourself from society or the society separating themselves from the older adults. No. So mostly they want to join in other things to keep them healthy, to keep them active. I think the first day we were discussing, we said that uh, some of our parents wouldn't even want to stay at home. They want to go out there. Even if they are retirement, they want to even be in a shop. They want to, most of our nurses, they retire and then they, they are still practicing in the private hospital. Sometimes it's not about the money because you realize that these are private hospitals. If it's not in Accra, even in Accra, there are specific places where they pay much. But some places, and then we our Kumasi and other other centers as well. We know that they don't pay much in the private sector. The 400 Ghana and the 500 Ghana. They don't need it. Some will need it, but some also don't need it. But they don't want to be at home, right? They want to join in, see people, talk to them, 
and then at least know that they are quite up and healthy. But even with that, whenever you are also adding them on, we are careful as to how they tend to evolve them. Even in our normal hosp our hospitals, for instance, when you have somebody you know that in the next one year or two years, the person is going on retirement, mostly they are adjunct to our roasters, right? They are adjunct. We don't necessarily add them on. They just come to help. So sometimes, even if they don't come in or they have complaints where, oh, the, 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 that's not a talk, a complaint of the knee pain or whatever, whatever. Oh, okay, oh, you, you stay at home, you manage because they are just adjunct. But mostly they want to be engaged. Any questions for the psychosocial theories? All right. So we go on to developmental life course theories. And this one, you will come in here because I know you know about Ericsson's. So we have the Ericsson's, the Havigas, and then the and Jans. And then we know that Ericsson talked about all these eight stages. And then the last stage is mostly what is the most important to us as we are learning geriatrics or gerontology. Integrity versus despair. Integrity versus despair. Who will discuss that with us or who will tell us a bit about integrity versus despair? Yes, please, Richard. Okay, sister. So with the integrity versus despair, it's, let's say after retirement or pension or after you've lived the life to a certain level, you look back and you see if your life was worthy, you lived a fruitful life, were you able to impact the society? Were you able to do something for yourself and the people behind you? That is when you achieve the integrity. But when you look back and you realize that you wasted most of your life, and you've not been able to achieve anything. And that's where the despair set in. That is what I know about that. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's great. So Richard is saying that when you sit back and you realize that you have achieved a lot, you have helped those who are closer to you. You have reached the point of self-actualization. Then you feel good within you. That's basically about that. But in terms of the desperation, you sit back and then whatever your life is some way, whatever you planned on, you know, mostly by the age of 30, we all plan to be somebody. We all plan to do, to do this in life, to achieve this in life. Now you get to the point where you're almost like 50 years and there are things that between the age of 30 and 50, you should have achieved that you haven't achieved. You are there and then you're just desperate. So this is, I think, some of the examples and how Mauli, uh, Richard yes, has explained this. So, Assemble, what do you have for us? Please, madam, I want to try on the, this thing, the integrity and despair. Yes. Yeah. At this stage, that's where we have the retrospective accounting, accounting of one life, mm -hmm. like to date, and then how much one embraced life as having been well lived or opposed to regretting missed opportunities. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So, a symbol is also towing our, our, our direction where he's saying that if you sit back and you realize that you have really lived a life, and that is where you feel relaxed, you feel calm within you. But if you sit back, you analyze your life, and you don't, you haven't really achieved enough. Not even enough, you haven't even achieved anything. You know, we all have our needs. Apart from the Maslow's uh, theory of needs where we have the hierarchy, you have individualized needs. Individualized needs so that at some point in time, there's something you want. And within that time frame, if that time frame passes on, you are not achieving that. 
Then what happens? Then what happens? That is where within that time, when you sit back, you're not achieving that. You start um, this midlife crisis. Either you are desperate, you want to get something for yourself. Or you want to even end it all. Or you are there, you are not happy. Psychologically, you are not happy. And with time, this depression sets in. So Erickson's 1963 theory is telling us that the state pertaining to older adults is ego, integrity versus discipline. As Richard and Symbol has explained to us, the task of this stage is acceptance of one's life as meaningful and that death is part of life versus your desperation, which is failure to accept the meaningfulness of one's life along with fear of death. When you can you achieve anything, you're going to die. You don't want to die. Somebody, you know the first um, slide? The person said that he's now achieving something at age 110. So he's, he wants to hold on to more, more life ahead. Meanwhile, at that 110 age, it means that you're almost going. What else? That means that if there's anything he would want to do to keep him for a while, he would. Because that is when he has achieved success. So late adulthood is a time where normally people review their lives and determine whether they have been negative or positive overall. Of course. And then the most positive outcome of this live review, mostly their wisdom, understanding, acceptance. Acceptance. Of course, wisdom to also share. And then mostly the negative as the doubt, the glooming, the desperation also sets in. No one has done anything to you, but we come to you and you just want to just insult us, shout at us, and all those things. These are our 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 matrons and our nurses are in charges who are in the hospitals. Most of them have this desperation set in. And then they come out there and then blame it all on us. Havigat's 1968 theory, which is also known as, uh, or he, he, he uh, termed uh, older adults as later maturity. So for Havigat's older adults, he would term it as later maturity. So he details process of aging and defines specific tasks for late life, right? Including the adjusting to decrease physical strength and health, adjusting to retirement and decreased income, adjusting to the loss of a spouse, establishing a relationship with one's age group, adapting to social roles in a flexible way, and establishing satisfactory living arrangement. I think this one's we can discuss it overall, right? So who will take any of the points and then discuss it with us? Adjusting to decrease fiscal strength. I think, as I said, I haven't been the host, so I can't. Um, if you you want to take any of the points, you can just unmute and take it. But if you see there is a clash, you can just one can um uh, can mute so that when the other finishes, the other can continue. Have a gas theory, later maturity, referring that to older adults. He's saying that uh, later maturity, those tasks involves, if you have that laid in roles, then you're able to adjust to decrease fiscal strength and health, adjust to time, and so on and so forth. So who take one of them and then um, discuss it with us? Adjusting to decrease physical strength and health. All right. All right. I will that, uh, let me pick it relating to the adjusting to this uh, decrease health. Maybe okay. it is at the older age that uh, some condition 
may manifest itself. And not until that age, those uh, conditions may be asymptomatic. Maybe it may be hypertension. Mm -hmm. But adjusting to the decreased physical strength, mm -hmm. at that age, comparing your effort level, mm -hmm. being it like farmer by occupation, teaching or nursing, your mm -hmm. output may not be the same as compared to your middle mm -hmm. or longer age period. Okay. Mm. okay, okay. Thank you very much, Vincent. So, Vincent has rightly explained that to us. If anyone has a different idea, can add Abigail. Yes, Madam, please to add up to what he said, because at the okay. old during the old age, your cells, everything, the metabolism rate, everything is decreased. So you would have to, you wouldn't be as strong as earlier. So you you would have to adjust to slow down on everything so that you'll be able to fit in. Okay. And also, I would say okay. adjusting to retirement and then mm -hmm. um, decrease okay. income. Okay. So at um, at a certain age, we all know you definitely retire. And then during that mm -hmm. stage, so you won't be getting enough income like you used to. So with that one, okay. you have to adjust to the retirement and then the conditions that come with it, like decreased income. Thank okay. you. Okay. That's good. That's good. Thank you very much. Any other? Whatever discussion we are adding on, is, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to add on a lot because we are all on the right path. So if you want to add on, you can take a point or the same point, you can take that and then tell us something more. Any other? Any other? Madam, during that time, so you should also try to adjust probably to a loss of loss of spell because definitely you may have lost a spell and then the psychological mm -hmm. drain on you, you have to um, adjust to it. Okay, okay, that's great. All right, thank you. Yes, um, Grace, you're, you were on mute, you know, you are muted and then you muted back. Grace? Yes, madam. Hello. Yes. Please. Yes. Yeah. So adjustment to the loss of spouse was what I was going to talk about. You've been with yeah. your spouse. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah, you can still add on. Okay. You've been with your spouse for a very long time, mm -hmm. and then your kids are also around. So when they leave and then you lose your spouse, you become alone. You don't have mm -hmm. anybody to be with, leading to the establishing a relationship with one's age group. So sometimes to build relationship with others around, but they want their age group so that they can have meaningful communication with them and be on the same. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Any other? Can we go to the last three? Establishing a relationship with one's age group, adapting to social roles in a flexible way, and establishing satisfactory living arrangements. Hello, madam. Did we discuss uh, adjusting to uh, retirement and then decrease income? You can add on, Ahmed. You can out, add on. Okay. Uh, that one, I'm looking at it from the angle of uh, uh, your current status as you are working. And then the interaction that you have with your peers or your working colleagues. So when you are retiring, you are looking at those you are now going okay. to socialize with. So you are just to do so and you are now going to socialize mm -hmm. with in terms of your age mates in their house. And then you look at your income. Definitely when you go for retirement, your current salary would not be like when you go for retirement, even though you go in for your SNIT benefit and whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But you are just going to be given at the end of the month something to take home, just to take care of you. So you look at the aspect of your health, how you used to spend. You can't spend that way. So you have to look at the two and then you adjust yourself to okay. uh, retirement and that of the income that will be coming after the retirement. Okay, okay, okay. That's great, I mean, Thank you very much. Who else? Madam, somebody, somebody is painting there. 
Yeah, please, please whoever stop. is writing on our screen should stop. Well, yes. Simba, were you about talking? Yes, please. I also want to talk about establishing a relationship with one's age mate. Okay. You know, at that age, you see yourself to be grown. You see yourself to be aged. Mm -hmm. So you find out that you can't associate yourself to young people close to you. You start getting your colleagues. You can get started and say, oh, this person was my colleague. Oh, is it, I, I think like, oh, we used to be friends. So you see that you start establishing relationships with them. Then once once in a while, the person will come to you and you have some uh, you have some conversation and now you will go there. So in that way, so you start establishing, you will not associate yourself much to the and the ones. that you are older than them. Right. Because you see that you see that those people you can give birth to them, and then what okay. you know you, or or what you have passed through, they've not passed through before. So you start like you 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 will not associate much to them, but those that you associate might be your police that you were moving together or rooming together, if only they are also alive. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you too. So yes, whatever you, you all have said is right on point and then it has really explained all the points for us adapting to social roles in a flexible way in as much as that we have the last point where we say establishing a satisfactory living array is almost always the same with the last but one point you didn't want to stress yourself so much right you didn't want to stretch yourself so much and so if there are anything you're supposed to do you want it in a comfortable way You are not going to, if there is a time you have to suppose, you are supposed to, the normal ones, even wake up around 4 a.m. to read, to do that, to, to do this, to do that. For you, you have to make yourself comfortable, have a good night's sleep. If it's at 7 or 8, you have to wake up. Because, of course, you are on retirement. And maybe even if you are working, maybe you are doing your own work, or even if it's somebody's work, at least, they have to give you a consideration. And so mostly the things that you do, you don't really stress yourself. And this is a way also, in a, in, in a way we term it um, disengagement where uh, it's not about withdrawing from the society, but in this one, you allow yourself to, evolve, you involve yourself in a, a new roles where you have to grandparents, a child, a, a, a grandchild, you have to be called a senior citizen where someone rightly talked about forming these age groups uh, you're the same age as you, so you call yourself senior citizens. Somebody also talked about friendship, so that is where you are a true friend because now you are not you, you are so uh, quite limited, and you have flexible ways of living, or flexible ways of uh, doing things, and so you have time for yourself as well. So this is where you are called a true friend to a friend, or a true friend to a daughter, a true friend to a son a true friend to a grandchild, or even a true friend to a husband or a wife. So this really, this this part of um, later maturity or having us theory really fits in in this psychosocial theory so much. It's, you know, the, we, we talk about the psychosocial theory uh, before we came to the developmental, but you, you realize that what we have in having us here, in a way, is um, joining hands with the psychosocial theory as well. So that's all about the having gas theory. Whoever is still writing on the screen is still doing a good job. Now we have our last theory for the day, which is Jung's theory. Jung's theory. And it's called the theory of individualism. Individualism, 1959. It's also a sort of you find it in a book called The Stages of Life. So it's not necessarily um a theory of aging, but it's in stages of life where we have a theory of individualism. And then the, the, the geriatric practices have adapted it, right? They have adapted it. So the stages of life, it touches upon the psychological developments and then the changes and opportunities associated with aging. That's all about the Jung's theory. So John Stewart proposes that the development continues throughout life by a process of searching, 
questioning and setting goals that are consistent with the individual's personality. So at this stage, they begin to question whether the decision and choices they have made were the right choices for them or not. So in a way, we are reflecting to the uh, whose theory? In a way, we are reflecting to whose theory of development, please? Erickson. Yes, yes, that's great. Erickson's theory of integrity versus despair, ego integrity versus despair. And so that is where the midlife crisis also sets in. So in Jung's theory, he specifically stated the midlife crisis. Jung proposes that the individual is likely to shift from an outward focus with concerns about success and social position to a more inward focus. So he is also saying that that is where you find out your true self. So you search for answers for who you really are. Have I made it? Have I not made it? Am I really this? Am I really that? Did I really do well for myself? Or I was always living according to people's uh, or societal norms or whatever society would say. It wasn't about myself. But one thing we have to realize that in all these things, everything, mostly we have to focus on ourselves. Fine, we have family, we have kids, we have husbands, we have wives. It's always about somebody. We have the society, yes, of course. We have our church. We have our religion. But is it about them or is it about us? Because I don't the day with these theories and these books that uh, is always on geriatrics, you read more and you realize that at some point in time, you are going to regret you believing in somebody and not believing in yourself. You are going to regret you believing in society and what society did for you and not what you did for society. And these are the things that we have to really be cautious of because no matter what we do in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, we will join the uh, old, old group. We are going to join the old group. And so we will be termed old, old, young, old, whatever old then it is there. Are we going to be desperate for the things we didn't achieve or we are going to be relaxed and happy with the things we have achieved? Right, so what are the implications of these theories? What are the implications of these theories in our nursing practice? What would be the implications in our nursing practice? We've learned about a lot of theories. You know, or should I be specific? So if, let's say we can go biological theories, we can go the psychosocial, then we can talk about developmental. So for the biological theories, what will be the implication for nursing practice, biological theories? Implication for biological, implications of biological theories. In lesson practice. If you want to also go general, fine, you can go general. Of course, we are not learning theories in vain. We are learning them so that as nurses, we would know what, yes, Richard, what to do for our patients or these right. elderly when they come to us. Yes. Okay, sister. So, with the knowledge on these biological theories, We've come to understand the genetic makeup of mankind and how they relate to aging. So we've come to realize that as one is growing, their cells start to deteriorate and all those stuff. And so when you have certain knowledge on that, when you have an old person you are caring for, you might be able to really care for the person holistically and be able to help the person understand certain things. Because when they get to that stage, sometimes, they need in-depth knowledge to understand that, no, it's not the fact that disease or the condition is something like that, but it's relating to the fact that you are growing. And that's why you are seeing these little, little changes 
in your life. So with knowledge on biological culture, we'll be able to help these old people understand their health well and also help them promote and sustain their health. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's wonderful. Ahmed. Yes, Ahmed. Yes, madam. So, yes. madam, the implication of this theory is to just guide us for now as nurses as how to take care of the agent, right, mm -hmm. from whichever age, the stages mm -hmm. of the ages, and then till when they retire and how you are going to handle them, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, psychological, physical, mm -hmm. or uh, sometimes when if it is a disease condition, their mm -hmm. behavior, how they behave, in the society, you, you, the way you are going to handle them. And to we those who are also aging, it is also a guide to some of us that as you get to this age, this is how you should be behaving till when you also exit from the active professional service and then you are now joining the age. This is the implication okay. I get from the theories. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes, two wonderful comments I've had in terms of applications to nursing practice. Any other? Any other? Abigail. Hello, sister. Yeah. Yeah, please. It helps us to aid in accurate assessment, diagnosis, and intervention, contributing to evidence-based and holistic patient care. Great, 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 great. Abigail, thank you. So that's also about the care we are giving to our patients. If you noted them down, then that's it, because I am not going back. I have had great responses. Symbol. Please, madam, it's also needed for the aged people to know that they are not neglected, but they are part of the society that we, we the nurses, and then the society as, uh, the society as a whole, also see them to be part and they don't feel neglected. Okay, okay, that's great. That's great. Thank you. John. Yeah, madam. <clears throat> um, it's also help us to plan um individualized care plan. So for the biological, mm -hmm. we know that every person is a unique human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a pass to. Bad John, man. are you offline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. So Elizabeth is also saying it helps us to understand their behavior and how to um cope with them. All right. All right, thank you. Um, okay, maybe to be there. Steven, are you unmuted? All right, maybe Steven. Okay. All right, so oh, this is that it's help on. nurse them. It's help us to nurse them all the grand style. Help us to seven. Can I, can I come again? Seven. All right. So Abigail is saying that molecular theories inform nursing interventions related to medication and illustration, monitoring vital signs, managing acute and chronic conditions. Nurses rely on this knowledge to implement preventive measures, recognize early signs of deterioration, and collaborate effectively with interdisciplinary healthcare. That's great. So, um, Mavis, do you have anything for us? All right. So, Mavis. So there are a lot, and then honestly, you have given me a very great, um, a lot of great points. Ahmed, Symbol, Richard. You yeah, have all Abigail, John, you've all given me great points over here in terms of the implications for nursing practice. I just have two extra points here. Uh, you, guys, you guys can add on. 
They can help individuals to achieve the longest, healthiest lives possible by promoting good health maintenance practices in a healthy environment. This is general. This is this is general. An understanding of the psychosocial theories can help nurses to record aging individuals with the developmental task of aging successfully. So the fiscal theories of aging indicate that although biology play, places some as uh, some sort of limitations on life and life expectancy, other factors are subject to behavior and life choices as well. And then the psychosocial theories also help to explain varieties of behavior seen in aging populations. So as nurses, we have to master all these things and know. Uh, um, is it somebody, some of some of you rightly said, at what angle? I think it's Ahmed. At what angle you are supposed to nurse this patient? At which stage you are supposed to nurse this patient? And some of you also talked about the using a nursing care plan to properly manage the patient. So you know all these things, and you know that okay, this stage, whatever this patient is going through, it is as a result of this or that, and so that's how I'm going to manage the patient. And that's so great. Well, we have some um, sort of therapies. I don't want to add this on to my slides, but I saw it about, in about three books and I realized that, oh, okay, I think they were talking about the same thing, but they all added on one particular thing. Afterwards, we are going to highlight it. So complementary therapy to slow or reverse age. You know, the first slide was saying that I am one 10 years. I'll always go back to that. And so I have achieved this. Am I going to die and leave it all? So definitely we all, at a point in time, we would want to get something to get us energetic and keep us going. The aged are there, the elderly are there, the frail, like, okay, for frails, they are frail. So, but even at that, they have other things, supplements that they take to keep them going. And then those, the young olds are also there, the active ones taking these things because they don't want to go to that extent where they'll be very weak. And so instead we have antioxidant, anti, yes, oxidant therapy, where they are proposing that the method of neutralizing free radicals, which may contribute to uh, the aging and disease process. And so it, it will limit it. So we have the vitamin A, B6, B12, C, E, beta carotene, folic acid, and then the selenium. And they are sort of supplements. So you, you you have you you see you find them in some supplement you, you find them also as a test vitamin A is there you get you can get it and take vitamin B B twelve and other things as necessary we know and then they said they are generally safe when consumed as fruits and vegetables I think I think I said these things when we we're talking about the biological theories as part of our overall diet and not necessarily taking it as medication and then high doses of these oxidants may cause more harm than good of course. They are all written in those books. I'm sure if there are articles are so you can get them written in there. So they have stated it. But high doses some of these oxidants can cause more harm than good. And there are no proof that antioxidants are effective. People are saying it out there. We have all heard it. But is there proof? So if you want to take it, then a nut nutritionist should be involved. There is also hormone therapy. Now with our ladies, there are a lot of things that they'll put in infusions. People are, are, have turned around to be medical doctors and then nurses. Nursing patients or nursing people who want to have nice skin, who want to, who wouldn't want to grow young, uh, want to grow old, sorry. And then people who want to always look energetic and other things. And they put them in infusions and whatever, and then pills for us to swallow and for us to also have it through our peripheries. So you can just imagine. So hormone therapies are there. They say it proposes mm. to replace a reduction to hormones, which naturally decrease with aging. So we have the DHEA, estrogen, testosterone, melatonin. They are there. They are all there. But so may actually cause more harm than benefit. If there's anything... If there is any medication a patient is taking, you know, for aged, definitely one or the other, they'll be taking some medications. We have to make sure that these things don't interact with uh, the medications they are on. And so it has to be supervised. And then the normal supplements, 
that is also so the ginsengs the coral calcium the other one i can't mention but i think you can see and other herbal preparations so they are all there and they are saying that there's no proof of effectiveness of course some of them are regulated by the fda and some are not so you can be there as nurses an aged or an, an elderly a young old whatever can approach you oh this medication they do that a lot my mother or my sister or my friend or whatever brought it from outside uh, when they hear outside, they hear the UK, the US, they feel that they are, I don't know, their medication are the top notch. So can I drink it? Can I take it? Can I use it? They ask. So if they ask, what do we say to them? What do we say to them? It has to be supervised. You can't see the screen. Um... Is it my light? Madam, okay, the bright way, light. We can't All see right. unless you pronounce it. Ah! <laughs> Seriously, no, you can't see. I can't pronounce it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I can't pronounce it. So, and then <laughs> our last um, slide here talking about calorie-restricted diet. It also says that, well, some of us wouldn't want to grow fat, and so we don't want to eat much. Some of us also, uh, out of aging, you feel that if you restrict your calorie intake, uh, you still have your beautiful skin and then beautiful young look. And these are what is also going out there for these, our elderly. And so how best can you advise them to take it and not to take it? For severe calorie restriction, this can result in inadequate consumption of necessary nutrients. You would need it. I remember when I was going to the gym those times, and then I come back and I wouldn't take food. It's a few weeks i was as slim as something and then that i realized no i was rather wasting so mostly it happens you want to look young you want to stay young but before you realize you are wasting away so with the elderly most of them are doing the same thing what are we telling them what are we telling them how are we going to advise them we have learned that as much as possible they come to us for health promotion it's not necessarily about the cure for elderly, mostly it's also about the prevention and about the promotion. Dietary changes should be discussed with the primary health care provider or nutritionist. So mostly it's either your physician or your surgeon, depending on the condition you are bringing in, or the nutritionist. And also we the nurses, is it the, we the preventive nurses or the public health nurses, then you have to do that. Or if you are entering into the uh, specialty of gerontology, then you have to as much as possible take that on to educate your patients on uh, these supplements and restrictions. Any questions? All right. Any questions? No, please. All right. Thank you very much. And enjoy your Saturday evening and your Sunday. And then have a lovely week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm.